on today's Island Meditations, let's ask a question that might be a little bit uncomfortable. Are you a better minister than me? <laughs> well, you know, Christian ministers, you never hear them ask that question, do you? And yet, how obsessed <laughs> do ministries become with things like number in attendance, new members, uh, boxes of food that were distributed, and so on. And part of that, I think, is looking for a measuring stick to compare ourselves to someone else. And sometimes that becomes so extreme that we even look at someone else's ministry and say, they're not one of us. We don't want them in our town. We don't want them in our mission field. Let's move those people out of the way so that people like us can minister here. <laughs> well, sad to say, that's really nothing new in the church. And today, we're going to look at a Bible passage where Jesus address, addresses these issues directly and see what he might have to say about that. And I'm just going to give you a little warning. Be prepared to squirm a little bit in your seat. Don't make me stop this car. If you're my age, that threat probably brings back memories of fussing with your siblings while one of your parents was trying to drive the family somewhere. That's what I thought of when I read the beginning of this week's story. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Oh, how rich. The professor's interns were arguing about which of them is the greatest. I get it. I wasn't a great playground basketball player, but I played with some pretty rough characters who didn't mind if there was a little blood spilt on the court. One part of the game we did master was trash talk. And frankly, I held my own in that area. This competitive spirit was misplaced in the disciples, and I'm guessing they knew that because when Jesus asked them what they were arguing about, they really didn't want to tell him. Spoiler alert, boys. Jesus knew what you were arguing about. Jesus was their teacher, their rabbi. When a rabbi wants to teach something important, he sits down. So, just as he had taken a seat to deliver the Sermon on the Mount, we read, Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Following Jesus isn't about becoming great. It isn't about being appointed to the largest congregation or becoming the most powerful lay member. Following Jesus isn't a competition. It is a call to be a merciful and compassionate servant. So the first lesson Jesus puts out there is that in the kingdom of God, competition has been replaced with compassion. Next, he took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This may not shock you, but it probably did shock them. Children were the least powerful family members in that patriarchal culture. They were the opposite end of the spectrum of the power each of the disciples sought. And Jesus is saying, see this kid? This kid is me. That kid is the one who sent me. You don't welcome the least powerful, you don't welcome me. You don't welcome God. Were the professor's interns all taking notes and nodding their heads in agreement? Nope. <laughs> this week's lectionary reading begins with them explaining how they had shut down someone else's ministry. Teacher said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. 
Was this person doing something that wasn't biblical or was otherwise contrary to what Jesus taught? Nope. He was performing miracles in the name of Jesus. So why did the interns, the disciples, shut that ministry down? Quote, because he was not one of us, unquote. They were jealous of their status as Jesus' disciples and were certainly not going to stand still for some outsider stealing their limelight by performing acts of miraculous, powerful service. Again, we still have a lot of us versus them mentality in Christendom today. The entire concept of the separation of church and state in the United States Constitution came from the fact that many of those who immigrated to the United States came from countries where people were being persecuted for their beliefs. They weren't even persecuted by state religions that would claim to be non-Christian. They were being burned at the stake because the Christianity of the state religion was a different group of Christians. Jesus again had to correct the wrong-headed idea that if it isn't us, it isn't good. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. There's room in the ministry for any who would show mercy and compassion. It isn't a threat to your standing in relationship to Jesus. Us and them undermines our status in the kingdom. Openness and welcome lifts us all. Twice now Jesus has had to direct the disciples to focus on surface and not competition or status. It wasn't sticking. So Jesus raised the level of his oratory. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. The phrase to cause someone to stumble literally means to lay a trap for them to fall into. Jesus used it to describe causing someone to sin that wouldn't have otherwise. One of the things they teach you in life-saving is that instead of jumping into the water after someone, you throw them a flotation device. Too many people who tried to pull a drowning person to safety themselves drowned because the person they were trying to save pulled them under. Have you ever seen a millstone? It's not something you can swim back to the beach or the boat with. If a millstone is tied around your neck, you're going down. Jesus takes very seriously our call to help others, to welcome them into the kingdom of God, to become part of our family, to join in our missions of love and mercy, truth and justice. As you listen to this story, there may not be any group that welcomes you. Many of us have been deserted by coworkers, friends, even family. You may feel like the only place for you in life is on the outside looking in. If that's you, Jesus welcomes you to come and let him identify with you just as he did with the children. My prayer this week is that God will lead you to a fellowship that has learned the lessons from today's Bible reading. We're not competing for top dog. We're not protecting our status by shutting others out. We're looking for those who have a need we can fill. Because when we find that person and serve them, we find Jesus and serve God. May you find that place of welcome and become part of the welcoming committee for those who come after you. Amen. So glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm No, no.
notice we say brother and sister around here it's because we're a family and these folks are so near when one has a party we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood join us with Jesus as we travel for I'm part of the family, the family of God. Thank you for joining me today on Island Meditations. I hope that in some way God's Word has spoken to you as we've chewed on what it is that Jesus had to say to his followers. May God bless you in the week ahead. And may you find open doors that welcome you. And may you open doors that will welcome others.